but the famous turtles all the way down. Karsten, tell us as we're waiting, if they he projects PDFs, can the presenters actually advance the slides? Or how does how does the presenter get that permission? I think there is a shared preload slide button next to the uh, hand now, which is how you should request. So my apologies, I will just give me a minute. I'll just sort out through my stuff and uh, I'll get going. Do you see this, the chair slide? Yes, I can see them. OK. In this case, um, welcome to online yeah. IDF 111. This is IoT Ops, and we shall start. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, but uh, they're not super full screen. Um, I think the, the very, uh, the, the footer is cut uh, off a little bit on my side. But I, the moment it's not a problem, but maybe reduce the zoom factor a bit at the bottom, at the top, so that we can, and just one more. Ah, close enough. So, uh, welcome everybody to our IETF uh, 111 IoT Operations Working Group meeting at the IETF, of course. Uh, uh, Alexei and I, Hank, uh, are your uh, uh, chairs of this working group in this uh, thing to think space-ish IoT operations and OPSA spacious uh, realm. Uh, we have uh, prepared something for you. The session is recorded. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are operating under the node well. It's very important to understand that everything you are saying or writing or you are basically uh, putting into media channels here is made public under the uh, uh, bylaws that are the uh, node well themselves. Also, there are some code of conduct rule in there, the BCB 54. Uh, so behave yourselves. Uh, basically, be uh, nice to each other. And I think we can all go along also uh, if you're aware of any, any patents or participation uh, uh, that involves your IPR, be careful uh, to, to put that into uh, the public channel that is in Notepad. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, if you're new here, there is a link. That's the participation guide. You can also find that uh, if you type into your uh, search engine of your choice, IETF uh, agenda, that typically brings up the IETF uh, 111 uh, page. And there is a meet echo guide how this uh, participation working groups with an online meeting works. Also, there's this link on the slide. So somehow you might have made it here and also then you know how this works. <laughs> um, there's a, a small uh, change here with this link. Typically, it is meeting specific. As we have moved to online meeting, this seems to be now a generic link. Uh, if you find any issues, uh, there's also a place for that at the bottom of this page here, uh, meetings issues. Next slide, please. We have a full agenda for today. Ah, no, that makes for all. We have, uh, do we have uh, um, a minutes taker already, Alexei? Was that uh, ironed out or are we still on the hunt for that? Yeah, I think we still need a volunteer. 
Yeah, so uh, this is also an IETF procedure. We can't proceed from here on uh, if there is no minute taker. There's a link on this deck. Also, it's at the agenda. There's an, a little, uh, I don't know, pen icon in the agenda IGMA page where you can click on, which brings you to Cody MD. Uh, if you have a IETF account, data tracker account, uh, you can edit that and become a minute taker. Are there any volunteers here? And just to remind people, you don't actually need to scribe, scribe everything written on slides. It's just when there are question and answers. That's true. And even we can uh, throw you some hints at the end of a presentation uh, uh, when it comes to some decisions we make here. Um, Oh, I think I just got a message. So we have a fallback volunteer, but we need a primary scribe still. Uh, there are 48 people in this room. Uh, it would be really nice to have a primary primary volunteer for a minute taking. Can it can even be a presenter? So if uh, there's someone here. It looks ah, okay. Uh, there are some people in the chat replying. I see. I'll do it until then. Yeah. Thank you, Kiran, Michael. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's good enough for us here, uh, and then we can proceed to uh, the next slide, which is the first slide of the agenda. I think. Exactly. So as you can see here, we have a two-hour slot. We are a little bit conflicting with other uh interesting um sessions unfortunately but uh, uh i think we make up for a really really good setup so these are the first three items of interest here and on the next slide you can see um uh, next slide please uh the uh continued at the end with another three items so we have i think we have about 20 minutes left at the end uh let's see about that <laughs> well that works out with deadlines here uh, and presentation duration. So, Kiran, I think uh, you are first, and now I, uh, Alexa, will try to uh, share your um, presentation for you. Uh, can I do a quick audio check? Am I audible? Yes, excellent, loud and clear. Great. So just give Alexei a few seconds here to rearrange his share setup. And again, Alexei, if you could exactly would scale down and just one notch more. Bot square next to the Yeah, cluster. perfect. Uh, is that a thing? Yeah. Yeah. That looks good. K Kiran, am I pronouncing that correctly, Kiran? Yes, that is perfect. <laughs> OK, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. So this is, uh, I don't know if this title of our draft is accurate or not, but what we wanted to do was put forth some of the ideas about industrial internet and specifically looking into the infrastructure related stuff and we are uh, next slide please and so mostly we just want to do discussion on things which are rela related to industrial internet not really focusing on consumer iot type of devices but the way uh, operations technology uh, or the process control works in the industry so I just give you some overview from where our thought process are or what the inputs for our thoughts were. And then we'll quickly go through some of the items where we have discussion. So what we are looking for mainly is um, just get some feedback if there are good topics that we can bring into IoT Ops or some of the other working groups related to it. Next slide, please. So this is a typical scenario for industry control network that it's there is some kind of a tiered model here. We have a division between the business logic, which is completely IP-based applications, or they call it IT networks. 
And then um, process control networks are somewhat segregated from those IT applications. And they are operated, run, managed on its own. Their job is to uh, collect the monitoring data, optimize the processes, and make sure they are run in a very reliable and resilient manner. And these are the things that happen on the plants. And most of the devices and the networks are pretty much physical infrastructure in nature. They are uh, devices are not constrained IoT devices, but they are more uh, field, field bus, serial devices, and um, how the processes are done with a certain uh, time-centric engineering. Those are the important artifacts in industry control network. There is a layer of PLC, programmable controllers, and then on top of that, there are some sort of system integrators which try to integrate different protocols together. So um, what's happening now is that automation is coming in, and automation actually uh, drives, the con uh, drives the new applications, which requires a full connectivity between the IT and OT part. And what we are trying to do is to find a relevant work in ITF where these OT and IT technologies can converge and sit together. Next slide, please. So some of the uh, properties uh, which I kind of went through that uh, these devices are um, location bound in the sense you know how a particular machinery is going to move on your factory floors. It has its own range, direction, a well prescribed uh, uh, location where it's going to move around, what kind of things it's going to do. And then the way security is handled for these industrial networks is just creating an isolation from rest of the world. Very rarely these devices, I forget about the devices, even network themselves do not connect with the internet, public internet, or even the IT applications they integrate with very um, in a very open manner. They have their firewall rules and very limited access between your enterprise IT network uh, talking to OT networks. And these are wired devices, so they don't have energy type of constraints that we normally see in IoT devices. And communication patterns are um, very well defined in a client server manner that a controller will send a request to a field bus device or a PLC to move a particular machine operation in a certain way. And determinism is an important aspect of these processes that when you want to, con you, know, you have a close control loop, if you want to send a feedback, a feedback down to the device, you want to get the response back. So these are some of the things which are different from a consumer-based IoT. Next slide. And what that, uh, there are some other factors which are different from IoT. One is that when we were studying industry control and process control protocols, there are roughly 100 of those, 100 of those protocols. A lot of them are related to field bus, like mod bus, profi bus. And even though TSN Ethernet is getting more and more deployed, there are still a lot of legacy protocols being used. In fact, there are gateways that brag about translation of hundreds of protocols and in a very stateful manner. So what that does is it creates a lot of headache for uh, people who are operating in the OT domain or in this process control networks. And they have to, any change that happens on the factory floor has to go through updates and upgrades on the uh, stateful gateway level. A lot of translations have to happen. And now, as automation is coming into uh, picture, which is the main driver for Industry 4.0 and emerging applications, the scale is going to become a big problem. And one of the things related to scale is that. Uh, you had these devices, and now they are um, using additional sensors to get the feedback from your plants. Like you have a machine which is specific job to do. But now, in order to make sure that this machine works properly, they have additional temperature sensors or some other sort, other sensors specific to their areas. 
So new devices are also getting into the same factory plant without any change in the um, infrastructure over there, without changing the bandwidth or the network resources in the network. So now you're not just going to receive um, from PLC or controller the command to the machine. The sensors will also generate a lot of data. And um, there is always there is also a talk about how you want to move uh, some of the applications close to these factory plants. So the um, fabric will stretch to edges or clouds so that you have um, more, much more closer connection between your servers and the devices. And that what that brings a challenge related to reliability and resiliency. Next slide. So what is uh, so these the whole concern around uh, automation? We can split it into two or three different scenarios. One is the study of the OT and IT convergence itself. So today, one of the problem is that on these factory plants, you don't have a lot of IT infrastructure. Like if you want to run a sophisticated AI ML application or off-the-shelf applications. Those things are not possible, but when you start talking about automation, those things have to be brought in. So you have a choice. Either you bring those sophisticated service uh, servers on the plant, and then your uh, operators who are running those plants have to know both aspects of the things, the IT and the OT part. Or you have to find a way to move this data out somewhere in the edge or the cloud where you can do processing. So this is still an open problem. And um, when you're talking about uh, automation, there is machine to machine communication that you will have these servers trying to tell how to uh, modify a particular process, how to optimize it, how to change the behavior. When these things are coming from the machines itself, there is a lot of data. And these are simply the commands that are going to the machines. So the overheads related to overlays and IP kind of infrastructure is uh, going to be quite expensive for uh, factory plants. And another interesting aspect is virtualization that today, as I said, that most of the physical, uh, uh, most of the infrastructure is quite physical in nature, but there are talks about how you can virtualize these PLCs so that depending upon what kind of uh, functional procedure you're performing, the role of PLC can change. You, have, you can have multiple instances of virtu virtual PLCs to operate on your field bus devices. And uh, in an advanced case, which I'm not even taking seriously right now, is about the digital twin instances where you will have not just one device or a one machinery, you will have combination of those things that create some kind of an instance of your operation. So these are that is also related to virtualization in some sense. So that's an interesting scenario to look at. And the next slide, please. And the third, third thing is, implications due to growth in data. As I mentioned that uh, more, more and more applications will become compute in intensive. So for example, if you want to have cameras for inspection on the factory floor, that's going to generate a lot of data. So what's your choice? Do you want to process that data on a factory floor or somewhere on the remote side? If you want to do it on the remote side, you have to increase the bandwidth of the entire network or you will have to come up with, again, some sophisticated mechanisms that uh, how do you manage quality control and just send a summary of data to the IT network, which is outside your plant. And then there is another aspect of uh, which is related to data is that even factory floor, as you start building the automation component, your factory floor is not just one network. It is combination of different infrastructure uh, networks. You want to do building automation. You have your own core machinery that needs to be automated. You want to do overall temperature control, the accident and emergency situations, intruder detection. All those applications have to be now 
you, you will feel the need to bring those applications onto your factory floor. And these, in my mind, are somewhat new scenarios, and we need to study them from the network perspective. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so those are the three uh, critical scenarios which I find interesting. And how do we relate it to the work that's going on is definitely DeadNet is working on the time-centric applications. So they will take care of that how your devices are going to be operated in a deterministic manner using TSN and uh, reliability aspects, latency aspects are taken care of. and. Uh, I was attending like IoT Ops last time, and there was discussion about the life cycle and onboarding things. So to be honest, I haven't really understood how those things can fit into industrial uh, field bus devices perspective, because those devices do not have a lot of network related presence in them. But we can certainly look into things such as compressed header. How can we bring compressed header into uh, the uh, OT devices and uh, have them interface with IP-based uh, servers for IT-OT integration? There is a lot of focus or uh, discussions, at least on the major mailing list, about the addressing-related efforts. And uh, that could also be a relevant work and interest. So industrial internet becomes a relevant use case for those uh, those type of cases addressing related cases where we say that uh, something like ipv6 address is going to be too big for devices because those devices normally are field bus with eight bit of information or two bytes of information so you would want to come up with a slightly shorter address space and then um TSN is working on some profile related to IT and OT integration, and this is done under OPC UA. So I haven't gone through this part very clearly, but there are some bits and pieces of work going around, but nobody's looking at things from the network infrastructure level. Next slide, please. And this is what I was talking about, that how there is a kind of difference between the IP stack and the industrial protocol. So in industrial protocol, we have multiple protocols sitting together, and pretty much they ride on top of either the physical layer directly or just on the data link layer. As such, there is no network layer in between. But when we start talking about scalability or uh, things that have to extend all the way to the edge or the cloud, and you have may have to transit through different networks, having some kind of network layer presence will be quite an important aspect. And next slide. So these are the um, potential work areas we had in mind. What we can do is we can break down the problem and look at it from the device side uh, perspective. This is something I think which was discussed in last IoT Ops and interim meeting also. And uh, so what that one of the things that will involve is how do we handle um, compressed headers, something like SHIC, ROHC protocol, or maybe altogether a new format because you don't have network layer or any instance of network within um, these field bus devices or a smaller factory devices. And then we can also look into the network specific work where um, we can think about stateless gateways or maybe encapsulation free communication between a device, a machinery, which is which supports Modbus or Profibus on one side, talking to some IT application, which is IP based, where you might want to run some kind of ML or M, uh, AI model to collect the data from these sensors, or maybe just have a virtual PLC with an IP address that wants to communicate with the field bus device. And uh, network layer for industrial devices. So personally, I think that's quite an interesting area because as we said that these devices 
they have just one address that represents physical address net, um, and data link address. There is no such thing as network addresses associated with device. One thing we could look at is how my network stack on the device side will look like when it has to communicate with some IP-based device or, or IP-based server or application, virtual PLC. So these are the three potential work areas we had in mind. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just um, a pictorial representation on the left-hand side. It's actually represent current uh, state. We have different protocols like building automation. And within that, you will see different flavors that either it has IP or some different kind of transport protocol running on top of it. And you could have Profibus. And it's pretty complex that sometimes you will have your controller uh, running Profibus and it needs to talk to Modbus device. And then that's where you need all these protocol uh, gateway translations. And what we have in mind is a vision going forward that on the right hand side, can we have, let's say, for example, IP nodes that are talking to directly talking to a device with its own address space, for example, Modbus is one address space, Profibus is another address space. How do we find a communication between these devices, not just normalizing everything into an all IP, same kind of source and destination addresses, but having some kind of asymmetric behavior to those addresses? Next slide. Yeah, so that was my last slide. And these are some of the open questions I had in mind that uh, um, does this group think there is a value in supporting IT and OT network technologies and coming up with some solutions in those directions? And um, specifically starting from the address framework so that we make a bottom-up approach. and. Um, um, Mike had raised one question on the email thread that we cannot do this work on our own. We need to get stakeholders. And I totally agree with this, and we can try that. But I also want to make a point that uh, typically OT networks have used the standards that are available to them. And if we have some kind of head start or we come up with a clear problem statement and requirements, it might help us uh, get those stakeholders interested in this kind of work. And there are may maybe there are other things like security is something I haven't added in the document yet, but there might be other important things that I haven't touched upon. So just wanted to get some feedback from the group and uh, what do you guys think about it? That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Kiran. Um, was, but before I uh, start anything, there's already Michael in the queue, so I will give you the first um, opportunity to reply. So I agree with you, Kiran. I think that we need to get ahead of this group. We need to suck them other the OT people in. Um, I think that, as you say, they tend to implement whatever specs are out there. And so I think that there's a little bit of we need to get ahead of them on the specs, uh, acknowledging that it takes us two years to publish a document and they'll probably ignore it until it's an RFC. Um, but at the same time, we need to have some credibility. So we have to have some OT people there. And I think that the right solution to this is to invoke Cunningham's Law. Um, and which is to say we should put out a spec and get people to shout at us and tell us why it's wrong. Um, and I don't think there's any other way that we're going to get a progress on that except by doing something like that. And it should at least be half right and only half wrong. Yeah, I think getting some kind of verification from them that this is how we are thinking is the right direction. Do they really see these kind of pain points? Just validation will be a good start in itself. And uh, we, we can always, tr there are some um, well-established consortium like IIC, we can bring people from there to talk about their pain points and how ITF can help them. At least we can try and do that. Carsten, you're up next. 
Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, really important to to uh, skate to where the puck will be here. So uh, we should be planning ahead. We should think about components we can supply now as, as the IHF that will be useful to them. Uh, so for instance, one thing that came up here is address sizes. That's of course not a new question. And uh, we we started work on that in, in, in various uh, uh, working groups, I sent a, a message to the chat with uh, some of them. Um, but in particular, for for the uh, run IPv6 addresses in, in environments with limited network resources, uh, we have a pretty good solution, which is 6 low band. And um, I think we should look at how we can use something like 6 low band um, to actually uh, make addresses uh, small in the the uh, industrial internet environment. There's one problem here, uh, which is these weird devices not only use different kinds of addresses, they also use different kinds of network schematics. And yeah. uh, we, we will, of course, run into serious pro problems when we ignore uh, that. So some form of gateway between traditional IT and, and uh, uh, various OT network technologies will be necessary. There is no way around that. You cannot simply connect the Bluetooth device to the internet and, and hope that something useful happens. That, that's not the way it works. You have to have some, some translation um, mechanism there. And so for that, uh, the way I look at it is that that is at the interface level, right? I mean, just imagine a router, you have some line cards with copper RJ45 interfaces and some are with gig optical ports. So it's similar to that. That's how the gateways for I, uh, industrial network are designed today. But beyond just those physical interfaces, you still need to understand data in a more meaningful manner now. And what I have, I'm looking at emerging applications. Maybe things are working fine for now, but to have a sensible meaning from the data, like when you uh, did the quality analysis through camera for an for some object or material in the factory, whether it was good quality or not, so you might want to have some context or metadata associated with that. And that's where network layer will come into uh, use. It'll be useful, maybe. Yeah, so, so it's really easy to write up an IP of a Nutbus spec. So we, we have an existing spec, uh, IP MSTP. We could uh, just change a little bit, and then it would be IP over Modbus. But th th there's no point to that, because the devices that are on the Modbus have no idea what IP packets are. So we need to yeah. have uh, some some idea of, uh, of uh, uh, making these uh, networks available. And that is probably something that only the the SDOs that define the net, these networks uh, really can do. So what we maybe should provide is a framework or some components that might be useful in, in making that happen. Yeah, so, so um, to, to give Elliot at least a minute also in this line here, I just want to comment, there are a lot of barriers between a factory floor and the cloud, and we have to traverse a few of them. And I think all of them brings their own sets of problem statements that should be captured explicitly. That seems to be a good way forward. And now, Elliot, uh, the floor is yours for the end of my line. Thank you very much, uh, Hank. And uh, thank you, Kiran, for your presentation. Um, uh, it's interesting that uh, both you and Michael said uh, that if, if, if we build it, they will come. That is to say, or at least they'll scream at us, one of the two. Um, in one particular case, they did neither. And it was with TLS. Uh, if you've been involved in OPCFLC, you know, they pretty much reinvented TLS, which is not so good, right? Because they probably did it poorly. Um, mm -hmm. We have a lot of people here at, at the IETF that work really hard at it. But one question we have to ask is, why did they do that, right? What is it that about what they did for themselves that we couldn't deliver to them? I think that would be a very useful question. And I think one of the great ways to start is to say, uh, is to ask the questions like you, you have some overlapping technology. What caused you to build it? 
what was wrong? You know, it, can you can you state? Can we get some critiques as to what problems we weren't solving or what problems we caused with the technologies that we did? And I love your idea, by the way, Kieran, of reaching out to the IIC um, and having them come here. I mean, it might even be a sort of fun once we start meeting in person again to do like a to to go to them and have a, a, a an interim meeting of this group with uh, you know, somewhere in proximity to IIC. So I love that idea, I think it's great. Anyway, uh, just, just a caution about, you know, not it, 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 sometimes they don't even tell us. And so the communication aspects, one of the things I, I think uh, we, could, we might take from this conversation, and maybe this is for the chairs to consider, is if you could put together a couple of liaison statements to OPCFLC and to IIC, uh, along the lines, telling them about us, telling telling them about the group, telling them we're looking for uh, open problems, and and also that where where they found technology that they couldn't use, and and you know TLS is just one example. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so this definitely you. is an interesting topic, but I really have to cut this uh, short a little bit to give the other presenters their time. Um, but again, uh, Kiran, uh, please please push this on the list, uh, uh, dissect it to, to it, uh, smaller items that you want to uh, prioritize maybe, and, and, and please, please stay with us. This, this is a good way forward. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that. Thanks a lot for all the feedback. Michael, you're up next. Try pushing this uh, slide button. So I can, or can I share my own slides? Alexei is sharing for you, I assume. Well, I know. I'd like to be able to just push the butt down button quickly myself, if I can do that. No? All right. Hold uh, on, I'm trying. Yeah. You gonna let me? Uh... Oh, hold on. Chairs has to. Uh... Okay. There we go. I can the slides. There are those. The slides. Share. And I think I'm in control now. Oh, but I picked the wrong slides. Let's try again. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. This this laugh is now a record. <laughs> Let's try again here. Uh, there we go. Come on, guy. Yeah. It's your time. You have six there minutes. There we go. Left. It's my time. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Does it work? There we go. I know what to do yeah, now. Sure. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit, a lot about locks and why you care about them um, and what that has to do with IoT. And uh, the simplest thing is to realize that a, a smart lock is like the simplest IoT actuator you can imagine. It has can have a single single GPIO pin that runs a solenoid that you know does something to uh, make your door open or something like this. Now it's not really all about locks. It's really it's about everything that you've ever had that is an IoT device in your home or or office or building, um, because ultimately they all build on this. But at some point, it's a lock. So if you're in a room, I would say to you, how many of you have a neighbor with your spare key? And I bet half of you, at least half, you put your uh, your hand up. Do you have your neighbor's spare key? Um, yeah, I, I do. Um, and my neighbor used to come every week to use it to, and then forget to return it. And so we actually wound up with three or four copies of their spare key specifically because they would forget to return it. Um, we gave them our spare key and the one time we needed it, they couldn't find it. Where is my spare key now? Well, they've moved three years ago. I don't know if they threw it out or found it. I have no idea where that spare key is. Am I going to rekey my house? I don't, don't think so. I'd like to just be able to turn their key off, but I can't do that. So this is what it's about here. You think about this as a fundamental problem and then you translate this to the digital world. How many people have your keys? How many people need to have your keys? So one way you may have seen this is like, uh, you may have seen this with realtors use, they have a lock box with the keys on it and then they have a key or a combination that opens it. And of course now it's as weak as the, the security is as weak as the outer lock rather than the inner lock, the keys. Um, and it's actually, if you know something about Kerberos, it looks a lot like Kerberos. And it's, you could even imagine building ticket granting tickets and other stuff like this with some combination of this kind of stuff where you put one, you know, one realtor lock key, key and another realtor lock and other stuff like that. 
Well, there's other ways of doing this, it turns out. Um, you can have these things which are OR gates for the keys. So any one of these padlocks, if you remove it, you can then slide something out and then finally you can remove the thing. Um, at who used which key? Uh, who has access to those keys? Uh, when you take it apart, can you add a new OR gate? The answer is yes. Can you build an AND gate? The answer is also yes. And the first time I saw this in a you know an alley, I was like, this is some kind of weird art installation because there was about 25 different keys uh, or padlocks on this thing. And I have a feeling that nobody actually knew who owned them all. Um, and so you can imagine that this is actually a place where a smart lock would be a extremely useful thing because uh, in addition to actually figuring out who owns which key and whether it's been used or not and is it still needed, you'd also get an audit log of who opened what where. Um, so who opens, uh, who puts your mail in your mailbox if you live in an apartment? So the mailman may need to enter the front door, which you have a code or another key to do. And then they may need to either go behind this system of systems where they can put the, the mail in, or sometimes there's no behind and they open the keys in the front. Apparently in France, there's an official key for this, the PTT key, which you have a picture there of. I got to wonder if the picture is accurate and whether or not you can cut a real key from looking at the picture or not. I bet if it was a real, yes, you can from that picture. Oh my God, that's crazy. Um, so uh, there are apparently regulations about who may have them and they're quite strict. Uh, so I don't suggest you cut your own key from this. Um, but that's an example of a master key. And uh, there is a master key in New York and many other cities that the fire department and the, and the police department have for doing things like controlling elevators, getting through front doors and this kind of stuff. And they recently showed up or a couple of years ago, showed up on eBay. Um, and you just got to imagine like this is a disaster. You can't possibly have a master key that is a master key for the whole city. And you have no idea who has them and who's used it. So the argument for why you'd want smart locks is is kind of overwhelming if you think about this from a, a, a widespread security point of view. You really want to have it happen. So how do the police, if they don't have a key? Well, you know, you've seen this in movies, you've seen this in real life and other places like this. You know, it's basically battering ram um, and whether or not they need to announce themselves and whether they need a warrant or not and what conditions. Well, that's a, 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 a different subject. Let's just talk about the mechan mechanism of once they are allowed to do it, how do they do it? And this is what you see. Um, so this picture, uh, actually, uh, I found when I was looking for this and it turns out um, it's uh, an, an event where the police apparently in Amsterdam broke into an apartment to rescue a, what they thought was a woman in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, who looked dead, but actually was a sex doll. Um, so you can imagine you come back, you come home, your door's blocked open, everyone's knows what's going on. You have to replace your door because it's been smashed. And if only they could have just entered it with some other, you know, less violent way, and determined that, oh, okay, this was not someone in distress. This was not someone at all. Um, the other thing that I thought was particularly tragic was, well, how do they even know which door to enter? And here's a picture I pulled off of a, off of a video, and here's the associated one next to it. And if you've seen this show called In the Line of Duty, you know this is how it starts. This is how the cop basically discovers that he didn't really want to be in this business because essentially someone was killed because a nail was missing and a 50 nine had become a 56 and guess what they entered the wrong home and uh then there was a cover-up and and you know it's tv whether it's real or not but you can see that that's a fairly realistic um uh, uh plot scenario it's not really totally security theory it's like oh my goodness you couldn't have a cover-up if we had an audit log if they had to actually access the digital lock and confirm this was the right one uh before they did this then that would actually be kind of you know, somewhat useful so when you're locked out and your neighbors don't can't find your key and this kind of stuff, you call a locksmith and they do something, drill out your lock or they have some other mechanism that they do. Um, and, uh, you know, then, uh, you know, they give you new keys. And does the locks, how does the locksmith know you're authorized? And I see Pete Resnick said in, in chat, happy that my smart locks do, ha do not have any connectivity, which is an interesting thing to say, because what he's really saying is that he's happy he doesn't have to authorize anybody, and he really will have to call a locksmith um, if he loses his key or it crashes or something there. So uh, 
where this this has applied to us recently um and you may know that we have this thing called dnssec and we have a root uh, root keys and they get signed four times a year um extended and they have a ceremony and you can watch it on video and apparently in february just before our pandemic they had a problem where they couldn't get the door to the outer safe door open so they hired a locksmith uh that, that picture didn't go well what happened to my picture that's the right picture yeah um they hired a locksmith and everyone watched him on video drilling out the lock right um so this was not a digital lock obviously this was a lock on a digital key but um the question was well can anyone do that well obviously not they had to get physical access to the building and a whole bunch of other stuff like that had to happen but there's a lot of layers of authorization and you know to do this and that's i think an interesting thing that's not what you want to do with your furnace okay if your furnace doesn't start anymore because you don't have the keys you don't think you want to replace it you don't think you want to do a locks do a, a call a locksmith because they can't help you so you need to think about who is allowed to open your door who is allowed to change the list of who can open your door and when it gets open who gets to know about it that's an interesting question right i mean would you do you want to know what time your teenager came home last night um or if they did um and as i said you just don't want to uh, have to drill out your furnace this is a really not a just about locks with everything else there so who does the authorization for you well of course you're going to say you i do authorization for you well okay so maybe you now have a spouse or maybe you have a more complicated uh family home relationship and probably at some point you have a teenager that you wish would an adult uh an adult child who you wish would move out um and now you have to ask yourself are they allowed as an adult to decide who can enter and exit your house it's their house too are they on the access control list for determining who is on the access control list good question um at some point the teenager the grows up takes power attorney and uh maybe puts you in uh uh gives you know has a person comes and takes care of you because they're not in town anymore so now apparently you may not even have access to your own locks because someone else has power of attorney so that may be terrible from your point of view but from the rest of our point of view it's probably a good thing since you're not authorizing santa claus to enter your house in a pr at, other than on the 25th um so the issue is well how did jet that work how did this transition work uh, out did you have to replace the locks each time that would be crazy because i'm not just talking about your front door i'm talking about everything and if things go badly for you uh does your house get foreclosed i mean that does happen at which point you know it's not really well it's, it doesn't really do everything it's not not slide transitions at which point it's actually the sheriff that controls your lock so how do we manage that how do we manage an orderly transition from you bought the house alone shared it with your your family with your children uh your caregiver and now the bank gets it this is a legal process this is not something that is like oh my goodness these are hackers are attacking your thing this is a legal process how are we going to manage that problem so am i talking about installing back doors and the answer is no no back doors are something installed without your knowledge uh recently when i look for the term people talk about backward doors as being malware that's installed and i guess that's the new trend but historically it was something installed by the manufacturer like a login like on the vms machines you could log in as service with a with a password i think was uh was service or something like that that's kind of, that's what i think of as a back door no so it's a front door it's visible it's audible and it's not a secret that it's there so am i talking about some kind of key escrow well that would work but that's not what i'm talking because there's no at no point do you want to install the uh local sheriff's key in your lock uh, so that they can do this. What you want is somehow to, because that key will expire, it'll get compromised, it'll be attacked. So you somehow need to say, I want to allow a judicial uh, entity to access my house according to some judicial process. And I want to do it like Pete without having a, uh, uh, without, without having to necessarily be online or have a cloud service delegated to me. So why would we standardize such a thing? Um, well, obviously, because we need to have good libraries and has to be better understood and we can't be, it can't be obscure. We want uh, the bugs to be ironed out. 
Um, and the third parties that we need to interact with, they need they can't deal with 37 different systems. They need one system and that's about it. So is this an IETF problem? Well, I'm not sure, maybe. Um, Oasis, I know, has also worked on this and in, in, it was SAML. Um, we have a bunch of protocols that we have defined at various times, which are authorization systems. We have uh, OAuth, of course, it's probably not the right tool. We have ACE, which is kind of a constrained version of it. Um, and we also have Suit and Teep, uh, which are working groups. And one of the things that's mostly out of scope for them is to decide, well, who is allowed to make the decision as to what's allowed to, what software is allowed to be installed or updated. And that's effectively the same thing as deciding whether or not you're you can install the uh, open all the time uh, to anybody you like front door software or not. And that's about it. Hope I, I, I was with time. I forgot to run my stopwatch. Um, your self estimate in time is um, uh, more the miss and hit. So uh, if there is anybody uh, wants to step up, I would allow a comment um, for now. Uh, in, in general, why people decide to step up or not, I'd say uh, yes, to some extent, the, the, the uh, omission of policy is, 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 is something I heard a lot, like policies out of scope, policies out of scope, and I, and I really get that, and, uh, because this is hard, but at some point, uh, uh, this, is, this uh, gap has to be addressed, and Elliot is the one who takes up the slot uh, for question or for comment here. I mean, I, I appear to be picking the line here, and I apologize that, for that. But um, yeah, yeah I, I, I tackled this issue actually myself in a different document on a blog uh, in May. And um, it, it was more about well, what happens when you move into a house, what happens when you move out of a house. Um, it's not just the door lock, right? It's, as you said, it's everything. It's the heater. It's the temperature sensor. Um, and there's probably an architectural argument that there needs to be a, at least a control function within the house to manage all of this. So that mm -hmm. when you take possession one way or the other, you're taking possession of all of this. But I actually had some practical advice, which was simply to inventory what the heck is there. That's a hard enough job. Right, so that when you when you leave the house, when you go in, you at, when, when you're buying, you 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 say, hey, what do you got, right? And and somebody should be able to tell you that. And if they can't tell you that, right, if they can't tell you how the heater is going to work when you when you when you're le when you're moving in, you got a problem. So just I, I think some document along this line is probably worth a at least an informational comment or something like that. Well, I, I would love to have a protocol or, or uh, um, you know, I, I can imagine if we could just get mud everywhere, then the mud controller in the home could have an inventory. Um, but maybe we need something. Yeah, let's not make this about mud. I, I wouldn't want to make this about mud. I just say we need to, we need to have something that, I agree. that, 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 that yeah. helps us here. But even just guidance is a good way to see. So, so, so inventory and, and, and complete, well, know what you have in order to know what you do. I think that's, that's a good premise. And dear Q, uh, we have uh, two minutes left of our 20 minutes buffer and then the, the buffer is gone. So uh, do you really want to step up? Uh, Brenton, Alan? Uh, this is a, seriously a very quick comment. Um, okay. Something like this is desperately needed. Uh, outside of the environments that uh, that Michael's presented, there's also a, a growing problem with victims of domestic abuse having yep. smart devices yep. used against them. So a mechanism similar to this one, if not this one, is something that is desperately needed to fix some real humanitarian problems as well. So, so actually, I was going to ref ask the um, HIP RC RG to, to review this. And there's, I think you and I both saw the same presentation two years ago uh, from a woman from um, Imperial College about this. And I was going to ask her for her comments as well uh, on places, because I think that is additionally a, a really big deal. Yeah, I think that's the one I was referring to. Yeah, indeed. I, I, I want to cut the line here, Ellen. Is that fine with you? It's really uh, 
need to have Eric on the on the presentation right now. So Eric, could you, could you please change to uh, Eric? Thank you, and Eric. Sorry for um, putting you into a, a more strict cage than the other, but our buffer is basically gone, so you have um, your a lot of time, and I hope that's enough for you. Is my audio working? Eric, can I can audio. Slides if it helps. No, so it's my audio work. Find the, the slides. But they're not there for some reason. Uh, were they in PowerPoint? No, PDF. Well, let me just share. No. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, does my audio work? Anybody is hearing me? Yep, in there. It just didn't want to unmute while I was looking for the slide. So, um, so uh, sorry for I, I actually published a draft, but I didn't get it done before the deadline. So it's actually there now. But this is sort of building on some of the things and expanding on some things that were I think talked a bit about at the interim as well back in March. But um, go ahead, next slide. Um, this is looking very small on my screen for some reason, but. Um, so, I mean, part of what's been talked a fair bit about at the ITF is, you know, you know, network the networking aspect of onboarding, right? That we need to grant some access to the the network. Is it just a local network? Is it access to the internet? We've done this stuff in the ITF for a long time. You know, people do things with MAC addresses. We've had this. Um, NEA, whatever, various things where you might have to your laptop we'll have to go through some assessment before it gets full access, et cetera, right? I think that, you know, IoT, the only thing that IoT changes here, which is actually quite significant, is that we're no longer assuming that we have a, a UI. Um, so, you know, people have talked about the stuff, the noob stuff sort of partly came out of the IRTF. You know, there's other things that have been discussed around, you know, Brisky and DPP, whatever, right? But there could also be cases when the, the, the network access itself onboarding is trivial because it's the physical access inside the plant. You plug in the Ethernet cable and you're done. But there's still plenty of onboarding going on. Let's need that. Next one. So, so one thing that might come up is, you know, yes, you might get access to the network, but it's just something fine and grain, like the notion that you have something like MUD, and it might say, well, you are only allowed to connect to these IP addresses, this rate, these port numbers, whatever, right? Um, yeah, there's some assumptions here about a device equals one application or the set of applications being fixed on a device. Let's get more to that later. Next. So, but but there are sort of higher levels in this stack, and uh, some of the things, or one, if you squint a bit, one way you can look at sort of the higher levels of the Anima protocol stack is, you know, you you will be getting some additional configuration, like OSPF or whatever it might be, right? Um, and, and that might require some level of mutual authentication authorization, so that you actually know that this is a valid. OSPF configuration, and you're not giving it to someone that shouldn't have it because maybe there's some credentials in there. Um, but but that's sort of a fairly, at, if you look at the whole st scope of things, it's a fairly specific case. In general, I, there's more or less, uh, the aspect of, yeah, can this be managed by some management system or some controller or whatever? And, and these things are actually, in principle, quite hard if you say it needs to be secure. Well, you could try to find it, but what does it mean to actually having setting up the mutual trust? Um, and that might include verifying that the actual device that is managed is actually legitimate, you know, um, at the station type things like rats, whatever, right? What, what do you actually need to check before you, you do that? But a key thing that actually comes in, and the document uh, actually talks a bit more of this, sort of the continuum where if you look at the IET Ops charter, 
it talks about things that are deployed at scale that don't have a user interface or have very limited user interface. Well, those things are not necessarily resource constrained. Some of them are, but not all. Right? There's servers going into trucks, driving around, um, wind turbines, whatever. Right? And factory floors, they can do have lots of compute capacity, memory storage, et cetera. But they, they still fit into this definition of um, IoT ops. Um, so they might, some of them might be resource constrained and run one or a few predetermined applications that were decided sort of at, at manufacturing time. But other ones could actually be deployed later, right? And, and you have enough spare room that you can go and do this, change the set of applications over time, et cetera. So it seems like sort of splitting this apart and thinking about onboarding devices, um, maybe part of that, maybe that has multiple pieces as well, because there could be a hardware maintenance player in this picture that might want to be able to see that this device is there. And so they can actually look at hardware diagnostics is the disk slash SSD wearing out, whatever, right? Um, as well as other players that are worried about the sort of device itself and the operating system on it, as well as the individual applications that are being run. You know, what does it mean to onboard those things? And all of these, both of these sort of layers require some, some amount of trust in the picture. And what is that actual trust model? So the next one. Um, so, so, you know, I think that we've seen, seen proposals or approaches where, you know, people do things in different ways and you can say, well, it's great if the hardware has some root of trust, you know, hardware, you know, I dev ID, whatever hardware certificates or hardware rooted certificates. Um, so you can check that it's actually valid and, you know, tie that with attestation, et cetera. But it might not indicate who should it actually trust in the other direction, the, the, the controller side of things. Um, and at the last meeting, I believe the, the, the FIDO um, onboarding specification was, was presented. So that actually pro has, a, has a fairly flexible way of ensuring that you can actually do mutual authentication and not um, you know, by having the chain of certificates as the device flows through the device through the supply chain. Um, so now you can actually, you know, without tying things too closely to the manufacturer, be able to do this. But, but it's still fairly complicated. So there could be other ways as well. Like one thing that's quite simple is sort of configuring things once and then figuring out how that imprinting actually flows through the system. So there's, forget, forget the order of the slide, but go to the next one. Um, so yeah, so the, the example is the thing that, that I and a few other, others have been working on in the Linux Foundation, which is Project Eve, which is basically doing this stuff where you, you imprint things up front and you're setting up, here's actually who you can actually trust the certificate. And then the actual device has some certificate as well that you can actually extract. And now you can actually, you know, Within these set of constraints, you can now actually say this thing can now actually be controlled by the controller because it, it knows the controller can be told about the device certificate and the device was imprinted at, at manufacturing time to say, here's the, the party I should trust. So going back, I think the next one is just the summary slide, right? So, uh, if I remember my slides, yeah. So, so basically, the contribution of this is getting people to think about. Yeah, don't assume that there's a single predetermined application or even two predetermined applications. I think that we need to think about devices separate from the actual applications running on them. If you're a networking person, you could think of those as NFVs, but it could be you know AI application or whatever. Um, and it could be different policies, it's sort of tying back to, and this is sort of very sketchy, but that, you know, sort of the network access authentication authorization, as opposed to the, the onboarding from the, to the management station slash controller, well, what's the relationship between those things? I don't think that there's a single model that fits all here. Um, and then finally, the, you know, figuring out what are actually the roots of trust and how, what does this picture actually look like? I think that that's a key thing that 
you need to think about upfront because at some level it defines or constraints to set up the use cases or the deployments that you can actually do. Questions and comments? And how did I do on time? was awesome. You have some time for comments here. And uh, there was one question from Hannes on the chat already that was uh, asking for a little bit about details about how Eve works, actually. Yeah, well, you can go, go look at it at GitHub. So it's all open source. So, But, but <laughs> was there some, something more specific that I can answer in like 30 seconds? And then zero. Was it... Yeah, sure, go ahead. Where was the chat? And why can I not see the chat here? Um, ba, 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 ba. And Hannes can add to that here in the queue, please. Uh, hey, Eric. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, I've never heard about Eve. So I'm curious on like, is it based on some other similar onboarding model or is it something totally different? Like, so, I, don't, I don't know where to start. <laughs> so, so it, it, I mean, it's sort of, you want to get to a state where, where the, the device actually trusts a root certificate of some form, right? Saying anybody who, who has a certificate under this root, I will actually trust to get configuration. And you want to have, likewise, have the controller actually have a list of the set of device certificates that it will actually talk to, right? And then how do you actually get there, get from, from scratch to that? Well, uh, you know, the different different models, they can actually do this, do this. But it's sort of, if you look at, I don't know if you looked at the, the FIDO stuff, more SDO, there's actually an, a, another project in LF Edge, which is called SDO, which is Secure Device Onboarding, which is actually an implement, open source implementation of the FIDO spec. Right? But, but that has, more complex things to actually enable you to track things through the actual supply chain. What we have in Project Eve is actually quite minimalistic, but um, but it's it's you know yeah public key crypto right basically standard you know think of it as how do I set up things to be able to do mutual TLS right? It actually does fancier things as well, but that that's out of scope for this discussion. But. Okay, uh, so thanks. if that was useful. If you if you have more specific questions, yeah, you could ping me and I could point people at you know documentation or whatever. But it's in LF Edge. There's a, a a last slide with some reference as well, so plus the document. Cool. Yeah, thanks a lot. So uh, any questions, of course, uh, do not have to be uh, bilateral, but it can be on the list. But uh, choose uh, the weapon of your choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Alexei, next up um, is, I think, Brandon. Brandon, your presentation yeah. is on screen, and you are ready to go. All right. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a new draft that I've put together over the past little while. Uh, the idea behind it is that while we've got lots of really great technology that's being developed um, in the IETF and in a few other places, uh, there's not really a lot of good idea that you can present to a device manufacturer on exactly how to fit it all together. So we got lots of good things, but not a lot of detail on exactly how it fits together and uh, not a lot of detail on what kind of security benefits you get if you put it together. So the idea behind this draft is to provide some kind of idea on what happens when you put all these pieces together. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we have some fundamental questions that we need to ask when, uh, when building uh, a device, um, so, or when uh, operating one. What software is my device running? Uh, where did it come from? Um, who can do software updates and, and under what circumstances? Um, and, and more than that, how is the software actually installed? Um, how should my device connect to a network? And which systems should it communicate with? And if it's got trusted software on it, so you think something that would wind up in a trusted execution environment, how should it update that? Next slide, please. So the, the really interesting question here is, where is all the trust in this uh, system? Um, now, I've, I've left TEEP out of this because it's a whole other layer of something similar on top of uh, this diagram, but I think this one's probably the more interesting one since TEEP already does a good job of covering its trust uh, diagrams. So 
you've got an IoT device and it's got to trust a device operator, presumably, to uh, provision trust anchors. And uh, at the same time, it needs to trust an application author to be able to install uh, firmware or software. Uh, it needs a verifier to uh, verify the uh, this true state of the application. And oddly enough, the verify tr verifier trusts the attester under certain circumstances and according to some policies uh, to attest the true state of an application. Um, the Likewise, the device operator and the network operator have to trust the verifier. The network operator may, in some circumstances, trust an application author for network access requirements, or indeed it might trust a, a third-party network access requirement provider to provide network access requirements. Next slide, please. So this actually looks like some of the technologies that we've been looking at. Uh, there's a, a variety uh, that that map onto this. So we've got rats for handling the attestation and uh, the communication with the verifier. We've got uh, MUD for network access requirements. We've got uh, COSWID or perhaps CoRIM uh, for the uh, information coming from the application author and going to the verifier. Um, and we've got SUIT for doing updates and uh, a, a, a fair selection now for doing uh, key provisioning. Next slide, please. So, what this, what I've come up with here in this in this diagram or in this uh, document is a set of recommendations for what the various parties in the IoT ecosystem should do. So, devices should, or I guess, device. Uh, developers should attest their application, should support re secure remote update, and use a secure onboard onboarding protocol, and use trusted execution environments to protect any valuable assets, be those applications, keys, uh, personally identifying information, anything like that. Application developers should issue a software bill of materials with each update, and issue model attestation evidence with each update. Um, and they should issue network access requirements with those updates as well. Verifiers should consume model attestation evidence. And, and so what that means essentially in, in that case, since I, I realize it doesn't map completely onto what I've written there, um, the idea here is that you'd use something like a CoRIM, and that would say what you should expect when you do an attestation, and then that would be an input to the verifier. So the verifier can then take that and produce a, a good idea of whether a device is trustworthy or not. And network operators should do a, a bit to protect their networks from devices that may have been compromised. So to do that, they can place a device in a demilitarized zone until an attestation report is received. And a, uh, they can also apply restrictive network policies to devices that are out of policy, like might require an, an update. Um, and enable uh, network access requirements based on those attestation reports. And uh, that's it. So very quick overview. It's a short document. Um, I'd be happy to get any feedback. Eddie, it has uh, the first... Uh spot in the q4 uh, and uh, thank you brendan for the concise brendan. summary of a uh, awesome document elliot you're up first yeah thank thanks uh, hey nice nice piece of work uh, brendan i think if I, I i i would what i would love to see is um this work focus on how our technology that is the ietf technology fits together maybe plus or minus with a little bit of extra from others but how I love the idea of how it all fits together. I, I, I think it's not necessary to create another document that repeats the NIST work or the IOTSF work, right? But just says, here's manufacturers, here's how it all fits together. And here's what this building block does for you. Here's what that building block does for you, which is sort of where I think you, you started and, and mostly where you go. But I, I think you should continue this work. And I, I don't know if we're allowed to adopt work, but this is the sort of thing that I'd like to adopt in terms of showing how the architecture all fits. Thanks very much. Thank you. And then there's Dave. Go ahead. Um, 
yeah, so this is uh, good work. Um, I'm trying to figure out what a, the, the best next step is because there's a couple different ways things could go. Uh, it could just be a roadmap document, in which case the uppercase should be difficult in a roadmap document. Um, it could be something that you claim compliance to, like a BCP. Um, although what would be odd is to have, since, since as you correctly point out here, there's like four different audiences here, right? Devices, application yeah. developers, verifiers, network operators, right? And so if there's only one number, then how do you claim compliance to it or whatever? Or is it four different things? Um, yeah, and so those are kind of the questions in my mind. And the last thing I was just going to say, and I'll just let you respond to anything else, which is I think your analogy to TEEP is a accurate because kind of your picture there mapped to a lot of what TEEP did. Um, and having an architecture that just kind of puts those together, maybe it actually is a roadmap, an architecture that would just be informational. So uh, open to your thoughts. So, Yeah, I, I think that it, one of the things that's hindered IoT deployments so far is that each of these parties just claims that they are doing their own little bit and and the rest of it's not their problem. And, and I think that's a, one of the big issues that we face is that we've got too many people and all of them are abdicating responsibility. So having something where, you know, we together do actually conform to this recommendation, I think that would be really useful. Um, and, and maybe that's something that that is too big for this. I, I'm not sure, but it is a whole system. And I think that it's important that the parties that are, um, that are part of IoT deployments do have to work together and they should together conform to, you know, recommendations. I don't know what those recommendations will be. You know, here's a suggestion for some, but in the end, who knows? Um, yeah, so I, I, I take your, your point that, that there's four different sets of parties here, but at the same time, they do have to work together. Um. Yeah, it was mostly about whether you go for like information. I think this is good work. I think there should be a document, at least one document. I don't know if it's one or a set. I, I don't know. So I'm supportive. Um, but given that, I'm kind of thinking about what's the right intended status, right? Is this saying this is a proposal for an informational document or a BCP or some standard track thing? And maybe BCP is kind of what we're thinking about here. And what's the right way to organize that if it's a BCP, that given that there's multiple parties here, how, how would we go about that? But overall, yeah, I think this is great stuff. I'm supportive. Thank you, Dave. And we will come back to the point of uh, uh, adoption of documents later. Uh, and I will make sure that we are uh, covering this before this session ends. And, and to enable that, uh, we will move on to uh, Ellen's presentation. Um, but be assured, I will uh, try to have this five minutes uh, to talk about next steps, which includes a uh, plan forward for working group documents. And Ellen, you're up. Okay. Um, so this document originally came out in, or is intended for EMU. Um, Elliot suggested I also present it here, just sort of a FYI as to um, it, it may be overlapping or relevant. So next slide. Um, the problem is that getting on the net is hard. Um, this document's about 60 pages, about 10 of which are various polite description of what vendors do. And this is phone vendors, OS vendors. Um, mainly personal devices, not IO, IoT devices. And this is just random changes in the last 10 years. It's really, really bad, really hard to do. Um, MDM vendors is mobile device management vendors sell add-ons to make it simple. But if it was simple, you wouldn't need these add-ons, etc. Next slide. So, the requirement here is that the device has some network connection. We leverage the uh, web PKI, and they have a username with domain and a password um, to authenticate with. And then if we can go to the next slide, um, the process 
is to get the NAI, which is RFC 7542, just the domain name, look up a DNS cert resource record, download various certificates, which then they can use for um, device authentication to the net. And these certificates um, can include information like SSID, um, RCOI is um, a Roman Consortium object identifier from the IEEE. And now the device can authenticate to the network, verify the server cert using the name and password. So the UI for the user here is effectively similar to that of the web. Wave your hands, you have some kind of domain you can verify to the user that you've gone to the correct domain, downloaded the correct certificate, everything's signed, everything's known, everything's trusted. And now the user knows he can enter his password. So next slide. Um, there is running code um, and it doesn't require any changes to uh, EAP supplicants, EAP servers. It's just put some stuff in DNS, put some stuff in the web, run a utility script, and it will spit out um, a WP supplicant configuration file or a OSX mobile config file that you can then use to get network access. Um, and this is not then trust on first use. It's end-to-end -end trust verified at every step. So next slide. So questions, comments, this is a very high overview, high level overview, as I said, the draft is about 60 pages and goes into a lot of historical issues, security issues, um, how this works in great detail, um, because in the end, given the confusion that the vendors have had about their products, um, I thought it was best to try and nail everything down in as much detail as possible. So I don't think a lot of people have have read it. It just came out a few weeks ago, but are there any questions? So there's Elliot in the queue. Um, you're up. Down. The reason I asked you to, to, to present here is that um, every problem that you hit in the user space, we hit over here in the IoT space in spades. And so one of the things that we might want to think about as you're developing the draft is whether we can apply some of the concepts which take the username out of it and, 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 and insert a, a different identity type um, a, as we're going forward. I don't know if you're amenable to that, but it, it's something we might want to think about. Yes. Um, so I, I had posted a comment on Emu um, about this. Specifically, EatNoob requires some kind of anonymous identity. Um, Dan Harkins has a draft in Emu, which also may use something similar. And so the summary is we could probably do something like create a well-known name at eep.arpa for this kind of provisioning. And therefore, every device could know that it uses this name, some kind of provisioning specific name at eep.arpa. And then every authenticator could know that this is a device which has no idea what's going on and is requiring some kind of provisioning. Thank you, Alan, for that uh, concise overview. So if that is a new ID, uh, everybody, please uh, maybe uh, spare a few, uh, well, maybe more than one minute, about 60 pages, <laughs> to have a look at it and uh, come back here with questions, uh, which is a good place to uh, place them. Uh, moving on to uh, uh, Torres, your um, uh, presentation is up. And I can say uh, next slide. Right, so 
So we're leaving the space of device centric and uh, security and going into addressing a uh, completely different planet, but maybe interesting as well. Um, that's what I'm here for. And um, so the motivation was that, you know, in other working groups and in uh, IRTF, so, you know, a couple of us are starting to look into, you know, um, what problems may we have with addressing and can we evolve beyond what we have in IPv6, whether it's within IPv6 or with the newer network uh, protocols or so, is completely open and, and is part of, you know, an, an answer. But uh, really, it's about the question, right? What 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 are you know possible challenges that we have with existing addressing and so you know i, I had some of my personal um answers to that and um you know from that i i started to try to you know come up with an idea for how we could potentially solve that and here i just wanted to talk about what i think um as part of the problems uh, would potentially apply to iot but then ultimately raising overall the question you know is is looking into problems with addressing specifically for iot something just you know to bring together and collect uh, information about problems uh, uh, interesting so next slide Yeah, so this is this is my view of the world, right? And and that's basically the that you know there, there's a lot of talk about just the internet and the internet is everything and, and and so even even you know folks like Brian Carpenter you know started to say no that's that's not true. I mean we basically have only maybe you know this is my scientific number only ten percent of you know devices that use TCP IP protocols are on the internet or connected to the internet. And the majority is really, you know, the under the water line that you never see of uh, TCP IP devices in what's now called limited domains and uh, maybe previously called private networks. And that of course is pretty much all of the IoT or OT networks, right? Manufacturing, energy, oil and gas, transportation, many of them very large and not the small, you know, constrained uh, device uh, IoT networks that have been dominating uh, a lot of the IoT work in the ITF. But even, you know, service providers, enterprise federation, you know, non-IoT networks are pretty much not quote on the internet. Uh, but uh, in their own domains and there is a lot of issues um, you know that are different than the internet and uh, potentially addressing is one of them and of course there's also a much wider use of um, you know I ITF uh, protocol extension features in these networks than on quote the internet and you know when looking at it I, I'm not even thinking that for many of these networks IPv6 is an improvement over IPv4 um, I don't want to go into all the details I've written down here they're all in the draft but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll regurgitate on the ULA, the unsigned uh, uh, local address, sorry, the unique local addresses thing uh, and how it compares to 1918. Next slide. So here is some kind of abstract representation of one of the main issues I'm seeing, which is that, um, you know, a lot of mission specific networks are constructed out of, you know, smaller networks that are composed together. And this happens hierarchically, right? So you may have an assembly line, which is uh, composed from uh, system components. And these system components are built from machinery components and the machinery components are, you know, built from individual devices. And so there is a lot of hierarchical interconnected uh, networking here that needs to be possible to plug together on demand and just having a single global um, addressing space isn't really helping anybody and you know you, you almost never even need any to any communication but uh, you know as we've also seen with the MUT work we actually do like in these networks to have very explicit provisioned or you know <laughs> automatically provisioned uh, you know connectivity uh, and the ability to rebuild these things very flexibly without having to figure out you know what does the that mean for addressing and um, that that you know in industrial but even in transportation networks that are as, as, as large as, as, as countries or so uh, is in my opinion um, a problem and so uh, next slide one of the um, uh, very common approaches on how you do addressing in these and that's why you know if you look at an industrial ethernet switch you'll always find some you know explicitly provisioned static not net functionality and the reason why that is is because you're using um, generic addresses right so let's say you have a machinery with uh, some sensors actors and a PLC 
um, you give uh, when you build this product, this machinery, each of you know these components uh, a fixed IPv4 address, let's say in the 10 net space, and uh, you know you don't have a per device addressing or you know per instance, you know you build thousands of these machineries, they, you don't give them different addresses, and you don't provide mechanisms for uh, you know changing the address on each of these devices, but it's just the gateway that will support NAT. And so showing here how, how you plug together the same or different type of equipment netting them into one LAN for let's say the system and then you may have another layer of the netting um, where you go then into you know, let's say this production line level right and uh, with IPv4 that's very easy with the you know middle two um, bytes of the address so you've got two layers that you can build and uh, astoundingly you, you can't even do more with IPv6 when you use the um, uh, unique local addresses because they also only have 16 bits free for you. Um, so this 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 really is one of these problems uh, which I'm calling you know independent address spaces and how you connect whether hierarchically or in more interesting topologies networks together without having to do a lot of readdressing in these right. And we've seen in IPv6 a lot of people standing up against the IETF uh, dogma of NAT is evil, go away with NAT, and have you know in the last five years or so we've seen more and more net also happening in the IPv6 space to handle the problems like this. And uh, well, we've got a total of uh, 26 or more um, IPv4 to IPv6 uh, net solutions. So this is all a very convoluted space uh, where maybe, you know, more work, um, even starting by, you know, uh, putting together a list of problems may be beneficial. I think that's what I had, right? Next slide, is there more? Yeah, so um, I'll be presenting my proposed solution um, together with these intro slides in India area and routing working groups later in this week. So if you're interested, join there. Um, but uh, as far as IoT Ops is concerned, right, forget about my solution proposal, right, you, whether you like it or not, but, uh, you know, how about addressing, right? Security is great, device onboarding is great, but uh, if we want to be more comprehensive, what do we think about, you know, all the addressing that we're using in IoT and the fact that everything is about the internet? Um, so really love uh, to hear opinions uh, and feedback uh, and challenges to that, uh, what I think is a problem statement. Thank you very much. Well, actually, thank you, Thales, for uh, uh, condensing down the uh, uh, take-home message here, <laughs> which I think on the chat already uh, found some positive uh, reinforcement. Yeah, that seems to be an interesting conundrum. And also, um, it is a little bit uh, uh, associated with our very first presentation, where we have uh, absolutely different address spaces, but then again, how do you mix them into a uh, a, a layered uh, IP network that is uh, inheriting old problems here? So I yeah. think that's an um, interesting problem statement. I don't know. Where are you presenting your... Um, int your area work? and routing working group. Um, so yeah. basically, int area is typically where addressing discussed, but then again, given how the solution proposal is related to routing, a routing uh, working group ah. is also a great place to go. Yeah, and, and by the way, you know, even what I for completely forgot when writing it and just reminded now, in IPv6, one of the things they tried to do and then gave up because, quote, the internet doesn't need it, is the scoped addressing, right? So, and I lived through that because we still have them in multicast. So, yes, they're complicated and they're probably easier solution. And in, in unicast, we gave up on them, right? They are, you know, they were des designated as the IPv6 addressing solution for, um, you know, private scoped domains. So, that was given up on. So, yeah, another you know aspect of ipv6 being split back to, IP, to to the internet which by the way you know it is the single big it's 10 percent right everything else is is smaller individually but in in total it's just a, a, a lot more and so um yeah michael has something uh, to contribute here yeah about a decade ago i um started a flame thread on the uh, aaron policy list about essentially why was it so hard for manufacturers to get address space that they didn't necessarily want to route, right? And they should have been giving this away like candy. Um, and, uh, and I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, I, if I want to build a piece of equipment and I need internet, I need IP connectivity, but not internet connectivity within it, then I should just be able to use, get a block, a reasonably large block of IPv6 
and I can stamp out a, a slash 56 or even 60 is probably sufficient for each device, but make them all unique. And there's great advantages to doing this. Um, uh, but the problem is you're looking at uh, several hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars a year uh, of uh, fees, which someone has to approve. And then the manager is manager who says, well, why don't we just use RFC 1918? That's free. Yep. And, yeah. and that's the problem, this guy, you know what? He doesn't want to cut a check for $2,000 to Aaron. Okay, when he can do this for a tree, he doesn't understand even the difference of this issue. What's the what's the problem? Back in my day, we just used squatted on eleven addresses, right? You know, that's what he's going to say. So this is a problem I think that we have in as the IETF is that that when we have this policy argument, the thing is, oh, we'll go talk to the RIRs and get it fixed. And when you go to the IRs, they're like, oh, well, we only really do internet stuff. Go back to six man. Yep. And I think this is where we've been for fifteen years, um, and. I'm not suggesting that IoT ops um, should do this work, but um, you know what? If if we care about having reasonable addressing in IoT assemblies, then um, I think that you know we need to push it to somewhere and get it done. Um, and I don't care if it's ULA Central or you know four thousand slash three or whatever. Um, it's not 4,000, right? You can't call it thousands when it's hex, but I don't have a better word for it. Um, we should do something. Anyway, thanks. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, just as a final note, right? I, I think that something like, you know, a problem statement, IoT, or even beyond that, without suggesting solutions might, you know, raise more awareness to that. And uh, I think there is... Uh, certainly a lot of stuff that 8799 from Brian doesn't mention about the addressing stuff, right? So maybe that's that's the starting point. Yeah, that's an, also a very uh, the trigger term, so to speak, uh, the, which is problem statement. Um, like I, I think this this uh, space here really benefits from concise, uh, let's call it uh, documents for now that might be aggregated later on, but from 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 precise uh, statements here that, that that really summarize them to to be digestible for external audiences. And, and yeah, if you can be able to provide that, uh, big thumbs up. Um, um, now, uh, transitioning to our, um, I think, last presentation for today from Kent, uh, the yeah. oh, SCTP at IoT Ops. Um, I know. Can you... <laughs> Hi, this is Kent. Hi, L late time joined to the agenda. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm. <laughs> I had a little bit surprised to see you at the end. Yeah, right, go ahead. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. And I see I'm suffering from um, size uh, and being challenged by the size uh, with the new Meet Echo SlideShare capability. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> oh, better. So yeah. I have uh, ten plus five minutes to go over six mm -hmm. content slides, um, which is not really a lot of time, but I'll do it again. I'm presenting today RFC 8572, AKA Secure Zero Touch Provisioning, SZTP, which was the, uh, or is actually still a predecessor to Brewski. And I did collaborate, actually the voucher 8633, sorry, 8366 uh, was factored out of um, this work and became its own RFC later, which uh, Brewski shares. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, okay, so at a very high level, uh, SCTP presents a technique to securely provision networking device when it is booting in its factory default state. Variations in the solution enable it to be used both on public and private networks. The provisioning steps are able to update the boot image, commit an initial configuration, and execute arbitrary scripts to address auxiliary needs. Um, and here actually is kind of where it's different than Brewski. Uh, I think Brewski just does the domain certificate part of it, and then grasp pass to do the, the other part. Um, before, the updated device is subsequently able to establish secure net networking connections with other systems, um, your orchestration controller, NMS, whatever you want to call it. But those uh, those secure um, subsequent secure connections are mutually authenticated. Next slide, please. Key characteristics, um, it is protocol is device initiated. So on boot, whenever the device is in its factory default state, which of course is when it shipped from factory, 
but also whenever anyone resets the device back to the factory default state. <clears throat> it supports both internet and non-internet based deployments, so private networks is okay. Several possible sources of bootstrapping data. Um, removable storage device, so here's sort of something new and different, but uh, actually you could preload everything onto a USB flash drive and or whatever in a feed device and have it nearby or plugged into the device that's booting and everything that it needs to completely securely boot uh, with mutual authentication uh, is effectively is on that um, removable storage device. So it actually doesn't even require networking in order for it to bootstrap a device. It can also um, pick, uh, leverage a DHCP server, DNS server, and of course, SCTP or, uh, has its own bootstrap server, uh, which <clears throat> winner uh, ultimately you know, gives you the best uh, interaction user experience. Uh, next, <clears throat> any such source may, be, may direct a uh, device to a bootstrap server. So a device connects to a DHCP or a DNS server or whatever, even removable storage device, or, or a bootstrap server, uh, any of those sources of information can do nothing except redirect the device to yet another bootstrapping server. And we've seen this in deployments uh, helpful where um, you know you, you want to go to a regional bootstrap server, which then takes you into a, a, a local, a more local. Uh, even when you get into the controller, the NMS controller, like it, it as a whole, it might have a public IP address, but then internally, it actually wants to, you know, uh, steer the the connection to uh, one of many um, microservices that might be uh, uh, spawned to support it. Uh, lastly, uh, as in the name, it is secure. So secure zero trash. Mutually authenticated certificates. There is, of course, the IDVD certificate on the device. Um, actually, it doesn't necessarily require IDVD. Any secure identity certificate, uh, such as 802.1AR, uh, would suffice. And then there's the manufacturer's trust anchor certificate, um, also on the device. So then the device can authenticate um, other bits that the manufacturer or uh, delegate might sign such as, next bullet point, the RFC 8366 vouchers, which uh, can be used to proxy trust from the manufacturing or the MASA. And uh, lastly here, it says, uh, bootstrapping data may be encrypted with the device's public key. So this is actually interesting in the sense that um, when uh, uploading data, onboarding data, which might contain sensitive configuration or scripts or whatever, um, how well do you trust the administrators of the server that are maintaining the bootstrapping server? Like, like because they can see anything, uh, do you trust them? Well, if you have any concerns whatsoever, of course, you can encrypt that data with the device's public key. Next slide, please. Uh, I think this is pretty straightforward, but you know, boot, uh, bootstrap on, uh, power on, uh, you know, is SCP bootstrapping configured? Uh, if no, it's just boot normally. Uh, even if it's yes, it's pretty much, I mean, it kind of depends on the device, but many devices boot normally, and then it's kind of a race condition. D does the device manage to bootstrap itself off the network, or does someone actually access the console and configure the device that way? Um, either way, it would ultimately uh, cause the device to boot normally. But anyway, uh, if, if bootstrapping is configured, then yes, it, then it, it goes into this loop. Is it able to bootstrap, bootstrap from any source? And so to the left there, it says, for each source of bootstrapping data, such as DNS server, DHCP server, bootstrap server, removal storage server, you know, tries. Can I, can I get any uh, data? Can I bootstrap here? If yes, then it configures itself, uh, possibly updating its operating system, um, and installing uh, configuration, running pre-configuration pre scripts, post-configuration scripts, et cetera and it's fully provisioned, uh, ready to join the network. Otherwise, um, and, and this might simply because, uh, otherwise no bootstrapping server is found. This might be because the device is, you know, from manufacturing with uh, SVT configured, um, is deployed in a network where there is no bootstrapping server. So it'll just loop forever, uh, trying to find something that will never show up. And so that's a case for where it might infinitely loop um, and never uh, succeed. And then another case could be that uh, it's a race condition where um, it is plugged in, but 
um, the server, the bootstrapping server, hasn't yet been configured to be aware of it. And so some backend processing has to provision the bootstrapping server to say, hey, actually, you know, whitelist this serial number. And um, then the next loop around when the device tries to bootstrap, it will actually find the, uh, the record for it and bootstrap. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so there are three bootstrapping artifacts. Um, conveyed information, ownership voucher, and owner certificate. Only the first one is um, needed if for transport, if transport's level security can be assumed, and otherwise all three artifacts are needed. Sorry, I need to go downstairs here because people are talking upstairs. <clears throat> um, the conveyed inf so what I mean by that is if shipped from manufacturing, the device may have um, awareness of a well-known server, perhaps um, um, maintained by the vendor of the device itself. So something like, for instance, redirect.vendor.com, and uh, the device knows how to, you know, um, it knows how to trust that TLS certificate, so it can establish transport level security, and therefore it only needs the top artifact, the conveyed information artifact. If it is not able to establish transport level security, then it needs to have message level security in order to trust the data that it's obtaining from the network. And that's when it would need, in addition to the conveyed information, also the ownership voucher and the owner certificate. Um, so within that first category of information, conveyed information, we mentioned earlier redirect information. Again, just telling the device, to some other device, where it can go to look for some data. Uh, and that redirect information can also convey a, another TLS certificate that the device, the bootstrapping device, can use to establish trust with that second location. The other bit of information is onboarding information. Uh, and this is the one that actually contains the information about what uh, boot image it should run, initial configuration arbitrary scripts. OK. So that's the first artifact. The other two, the ownership voucher, I think everyone on the call is pretty familiar with. The owner certificate is like the domain certificate, um, but how it's used is different. And it's only used for uh, trusting signed data, which we'll cover on the next slide. In the lower right-hand corner, uh, recently there's, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Thank you. In the lower right-hand corner, um, there's, a, there's a new draft, uh, draft IETF, NetConf, SCTP, CSR. And in a way, it introduces a fourth bootstrapping artifact. It's kind of not, but it kind of is, um, the LDEV, LDEV ID certificate. So what this um, a draft does, and it updates SCTP, is uh, enable the very first exchange that happens when the device reaches out to the bootstrapping server for the first time. The bootstrapping server, um, and, and if the device supports the, um, this, this draft, then it sends also uh, input parameters uh, regarding whether or not it supports the generation of LDAV certificate. Uh, if it does, then um, does it support generating a new private key, or does it can it only reuse the existing IWD private key? Um, if it does support generating a new private key, what algorithms does it support? You know, what in and in, in all that information. What what and also what um, certificate signing formats does it support? Is it just you know, P10 or CMP or CRC also, uh, CMC also supported. So it's a, like a fourth bootstrapping artifact is, that gets installed. <sighs> Next slide, please. All right, so conveying trust. Uh, so again, a device in its, uh, in its factory default condition can only trust the certificates authorized by its manufacturer using trust anchors. The trust anchor certificate is used in two ways, right? So the first way is what we spoke of initially, which is to authenticate the remote TL server certificate is signed somewhere in chain by a manufacturer. So this is that well-known service, like um, redirect.vendor.com. The other way is uh, is by authenticating the voucher, right? The voucher is signed by the manufacturer or its delegate. So you can authenticate the voucher. From the voucher, you extract the domain certificate. And from the domain certificate, you can validate the owner certificate, that the domain certificate signs the owner certificate. And then from the owner certificate, you extract out the public key 
to authenticate the signed data, which is that conveyed information. The first of the three artifacts is the one that's been signed. So you can validate that that has been signed by a signature that's traceable through the voucher. Uh, and then last bullet point here, if the source is not trusted, then uh, any response that comes back from a server uh, must be either an unsigned redirect response. So you're going to an untrusted server, so you can't trust anything it's in, it returns to you, right? So either it's going to return something to you that's unsigned, meaning you don't have to trust it or not, but a redirect response can be unsigned. And so you can just uh, uh, be redirected to go somewhere else looking for data, and maybe that's, that other location will be able to hand back a signed response. Uh, or, the, as the second and last bullet point says, a signed response. So that, of course, is the conveyed information that's been signed, uh, which includes also the ownership voucher and owner certificate. Next and last slide, please. Okay, so here's an eye chart, um, but essentially the power on the uh, device first discovers a bootstrapping server on the network. So however that might be, it could be layer two, layer three, removal storage device, DNS, DHCP, well-known service, uh, or, or anything else. The uh, RFC 8572 does not limit the number of kinds of transports that could be used or discovery mechanisms. It's just a, a strategy that's been, and four such uh, mechanisms were scoped out in that RFC. But once a bootstrapping server has been discovered, the next line down, you can see it's doing a post get bootstrapping data to the bootstrapping server, whereby the IWD certificate is authenticated. And then inside that request is um, information about, um, um, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So the bootstrapping server sends a request over to the CA or maybe it's otherwise been configured and it comes to determination that the device requires an LWD certificate. So it sends back to the device the 400 bad requests containing selected algorithms. I kind of skipped over a section for, for uh, timeliness, but in, that, uh, in the request, there was a list of sort of, uh, algorithms that the device supports. And then the device sends again uh, the get bootstrapping data request, but this time it actually sends a CSR structure conforming to all the different algorithms and formats that the bootstrapping server selected. Upon receiving it, the bootstrapping server relays it to internal CA infrastructure, which would then sign that CSR, returning back the LDF ID to the bootstrapping server, which can do you know many different things ultimately to get it back to the device. And here it shows it stitching that LDF ID into the configuration returned to the device. And that is the last slide, I think. Do you want to go to the next slide just to see if there's anything more? Yes, I see. Okay, so that that diagram really uh, went through all of it. So I'm not sure we are basically at the end of the uh, uh, last session of the um, last um, event of the day. So uh, people might be a little bit full. So the, the, this this document is is uh, tracked uh, at the um, uh, Data Tracker IoT Ops uh, Working Group. And no. so, uh, no, it is not. No, no, no. The um, I use the NetConf working group. So ah, okay, that is that is for example something interesting to highlight here because uh, if you want people to follow up on what you just highlighted here, uh, that is uh, good to know. So it's NetConf. Yes. Um, so for anyone who's interested, definitely uh, NetConf working group is working on it. Uh, our, again, RFC eighty five seventy two has already been published uh, for more mm -hmm. than a year now. Uh, I think it was uh, two thousand nineteen mid. Um, the uh, currently is the SCTP CSR that extension that, that enables the LWD to be provisioned at the same time. Um, honestly, I'm pre I'm presenting here to your working group right now uh, by request. I think by Michael Richardson, who was um, thinking that it'd be good uh, because there was some overlap and you know the work I've been doing and and this working group. But um, so maybe uh, it, Michael, is there any question or any way you'd like to steer this conversation? So we, we, we have uh, seven minutes left, and Torles is first a queue. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, uh, um, to give him uh, priority, yeah? Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Kent. If this is also discussed in NetMod, so maybe we can also continue the discussion there. So the one thing that you know I always liked about uh, NetConf, even better than Bruski, is the, the fact that it's command and control from, you know, 
the quote netconf, uh, well, I don't show what the right terminology is, server or so, right? So that the workflow that's exercised on the uh, client device, the, the pledge that's enrolling is controlled much more by, by the server. And uh, when we had the discussion about, you know, how to do the certificate enrollment a couple of years back, you and I, you, I think mm -hmm. were pointing me at existing Yang models that could be used with netconf to, for example, push an LDF ID completely independent of what's happening in before into a device through netconf. And so yes. I was imagining that the proposed solution to keep things modular and let it up to the um, server to figure out what to do would be to, you know, first establish and author authorize the server through, you know, pushing down the vouchers through the uh, zero touch bootstrap and then use an existing model to, you know, push an LDF ID. So this solution here sounds different from that, more integrated, less modular. So I was wondering about the motivation of this approach. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point, and you're right. Um, it is uh, more integrated, but I, I'd actually I see that as a strength. Um, like in like in storage systems these days, they found that you know by bringing together the lower level drivers and the higher level um, you know array, array logic, they were able to simplify things and and you know make it less complex overall. And and uh, I think that might be the case here as well. At least uh, you know um, I've been of course following the work going on in Anima. And it does seem uh, there's a lot more drafts. I mean, in terms of like um, lines or, or pages and documents, uh, somewhere you know, hundreds of pages <laughs> that are uh, that have been written. Um, but I wasn't whereas... comparing with 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 Bruski, right? Oh. Forget about Bruski. Oh. I'm asking purely okay. netconf. I use yeah. the zero touch to authenticate mm -hmm. yeah. the server with the pledge as being authorized to configure the pledge, and then using an existing netconf model to uh, an, an existing netconf model to enroll the LDF ID. Yeah. What's oh, sorry, wrong with I just, sorry, I have to I have to really barge yep. in here. So that is an in-depth yep. discussion that you really that Tortolis, please uh, uh, issue Netmod, this yep, uh, sure. question on Netmod or wherever Netcom where this is happening. And Michael, I'm very sorry to oh. cut you off here also because we have like five minutes left, and I uh, want to uh, highlight an important topic that is of course uh, has brought up uh, occasionally today already, uh, sorry, and that's. Yeah, can sorry. I just very quickly say to Torlis that the, um, the the reason I brought up Risky was because uh, it is the separated model, whereas uh, here it's more integrated. Um, that's why I was segueing. But you're right; I didn't quite get to answer your question. We can take it off, uh, offline. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Offline discussions, of course, <laughs> encouraged. Um, but uh, so the, the 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 topic I wanted to bring up here in our last five minutes, and I and I already highlighted that, is uh, the route. Uh, towards uh, adoption of documents in this working group. So uh, this has been brought up in the chat, I think, already. And I would like to offer uh, multiple uh, lanes uh, towards that goal. So if you think, as an author, uh, that uh, your work is uh, interesting enough to, to, to warrant a discussion, you could, could come directly to the chairs and, and highlight that, and we can orchestrate a way forward. Uh, secondly, uh, of course, in, in discussion or after the questions about documents on the lists and, and discussion there is an indicator for interest in some of this work. And then uh, as, a, as a third option, um, um, rename your ID in a way that is related to the data tracker of the uh, IoT Ops uh, working group so that uh, the chairs become uh, uh, aware of, of its, its uh, intended place. And, and and can make a notice of it. So so these are the three very obvious options uh, how to do it. And I would like to open up now um, um, the last minutes uh, of this floor to 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 either provide other uh, proposals or comments on this. Just quick note on on the logistics here. Uh, you can add in data tracker. Um, uh, documents yes, I'm to aware. the list of related. So that that, and we that did this. maybe yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you. But if you think uh, that is worthwhile for us to do, uh, contact us. So we are not arbitrarily now just adding all the documents on the agenda list here. If you think this is worthwhile to to be be detract here, uh, contact us. So this is not a, a self fulfilling uh, procedure, so to speak. Uh, you have to uh, do do at least one step uh, for this to happen. And 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 again, otherwise, um, um, I think that. Uh, a discussion on the list is always a good indicator. And, and also, uh, again, uh, relating it 
if it's it's for example not tied to another uh, place like uh, netmod or netconf uh, tie it to this working group here by uh, adjusting the uh, file name in the next uh, submit uh, as such so is there any other um, um i don't know a question about how to uh, progress work here uh, if you want to do that so for example i saw uh, documents that might be uh, uh, i think associatable with this working group and are not yet so so that would be a file name rename but uh, are there other uh, um, questions about this how, how to proceed or how to uh, uh, find uh, together here So if that is not the case. Um, um, we are we are literally uh, ending on time <laughs> with a minute uh, left here, and I would like to uh, thank all presenters uh, uh, for their, I think, uh, lively and, and and really engaging presentations. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the two hours of it, and and here in Germany it's like 3 a.m. and and that, that is saying something, I think. <laughs> Uh, so I'm 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 uh, still with you, and so I hope everybody else in this audience also was as engaged as uh, I felt. Um, um, thank you for your contributions, um, and please uh, again uh, contact uh, contact us directly or uh, via uh, uh, follow up questions on the list and, and show some uh, 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 noise there. And, and let's see how this uh, adoption progress work. We will schedule an interim for the IoT Ops uh, working group. Uh, uh, which is basically half milestone between uh, here and November, and uh, then we can assess uh, some of the intermediate progress. Thank you all, and uh, well, have a good night, good uh, evening, or maybe even a good uh, whatever we are afternoon. <laughs> and thanks all. <laughs>